All right, um, so I think we'll get started. Uh, we have a lot to cover today. We're going to be talking about the MET Plus Analysis Suite, um, and today we're going to talk about MET Viewer and MET Express, which are two user interfaces that uh, you can use to, to take a look at data, and then next week we'll be talking about the underpinning of the analysis suite. But before we get started, I, um, I wanted to highlight that there is, um, it's called a hackathon going on right now. It's um, geared towards uh, graduate students in the US, um, uh, especially in the S2S uh, arena of study. Um, it, it's sponsored by um, George Mason University, as well as the UFS um, Research Operations Project, the DTC, and EPIC, which is the Earth Prediction Innovation Center. Um, we are going to um, be hosting, um, allowing grad students, teams of grad students to come in and, uh, you know, contribute at least one S2S diagnostic to MET Plus and then use those data to evaluate some of the um, UFS prototype um, simulations that are available up on the, the um, AWS. Uh, registration ends um, April 15th, so if you're a grad student or if you know grad students who are interested in winning a, um, basically a, a summer um, internship at the DTC to work with the MET Plus team, um, go ahead and, and uh, check out this website and uh, sign up to, to help out with uh, adding diagnostics to MET Plus. I'm going to put that, the link to that in the chat as well. Okay, so there's the link to the information about the hackathon. Um, diving into the presentation today, uh, what we're going to be talking about um, today is, um, you know, all of the, the stuff kind of at the bottom of this flow diagram. Um, we, as I said, we have two user interfaces, MetViewer and MetExpress. Um, and then the supporting co components are MetCalpy, MetPlotPy, and, and MetDataDB. <clears throat> We're going to be talking um, pretty ex extensively about MetViewer and MetExpress today. <clears throat> As I said, uh, we're going to talk about MetCalpy and MetPlotPy next week, um, and we'll touch briefly on MetDataDB today. Um, uh, a lot of the, the inner workings of MetDataDB are kind of <clears throat> shielded from the users, so it's not something that we, we need to um, dive too deeply into. Um, so MetViewer, um, prior to... Um, version 4.0.0 and, and 4.1.0, um, you know, had this kind of um, data flow where it reads in both MET output and um, a legacy um, output format called BSDB from um, the Environmental Modeling Center. Uh, the loader would then um, load the database, load the data into the database. Uh, typically that was a, a MySQL database. Um, the user could either uh, uh, put together XML configuration files to pass into the batch engine um, and, and uh, to generate plots or use this web interface to specify the, the XML configuration files. Um, and all of the plotting and the calculations, the computations um, for statistics were done by the R statistics scripts that were developed. Um, it generates plots as well as scorecards, which is basically a synthesis of um, lots of different statistics in kind of a, a table format. Um, that viewer was based on Java, MySQL, um, RScript, and Tomcat. Um, during this transition time in the version 4.0 and version 4.1 timeframe, what we've been doing is we've been trying to remove the dependency on R statistics and um, and transfer everything over to Python. So we still um, support reading in MET and VSDB output. Um, MET data DB is the loading script that is now written in Python. Um, it loads into the database. Um, we have support for MySQL, MariaDB, and AuroraDB. Uh, AuroraDB is, is um, specific to the Amazon Web Service um, uh, instances and, and so forth. Um, the XML configurations are still used for um, telling the um, MetViewer how to um, generate the plots, but there is a, another level of um, configuration that is in communication between the batch engines and the Python aspect of um, MetViewer, um, and that's in YAML. Um, the web interface, uh, you know, is, uh, you're going to see a lot of that um, in just a couple minutes. And then um, we have the option to toggle between 
um, using Python and using um, R scripts um, and to generate either the plots or the scorecards. Um, so uh, right now, the packages that are required for MetViewer include Java, um, you know, one of these types of uh, uh, relational databases, Python, R statistics, and Tomcat. In the future, um, so in version 5.0, which is what we are now starting to work on um, our release for, um, we're going to be removing the dependency of R scripts. And so um, it's going to become a, a much more, um, a, a much less complicated um, package um, in the fact that it will uh, have its dependencies on Python, um, you know, MetCalpy, MetPlotPy. And then um, we also have the ability to not only call these, um, these scripts um, from the MetViewer interface, but you can also um, call these scripts from the command line. And that's a lot of what we're going to go over next week. As far as MetExpress goes, it's a much more simplified um, user interface and, and system in the fact that it doesn't have um, the batch engine capability. It doesn't generate things like scorecards, um, and it, it doesn't have the, the same configura configurability that, um, that MetViewer does, has. However, um, because of that, because of its simplicity, it makes it a lot easier to, um, to bring up um, very um, well-defined um, plots very quickly. Um, it just doesn't allow for some of the deep dive um, that you can, can do with MetViewer. Um, in the, uh, right now, we have a lot of, of the um, same um, components shared in, in the fact that um, Met, MetExpress also um, will load um, or you know, will, works with the, the same um, database. And so it supports um, looking, viewing at Met and VSDB outputs. Um, and um, in version 5.0, um, it is also going to be transitioning over to using MetCalcPy for its computation. So we'll have this, a shared computation and a shared database layer. Um, and then it's just the web interface and the, and the plotting that is um, slightly different. Um, I'm going to go over all the different types of plot types that are available in MetViewer. And then Tracy Hertnucky is going to be um, diving into it a little bit more deeply, showing you how you can use MetViewer to do um, uh, you know, analysis and, and use it for testing and evaluation and verification activities. Um, <clears throat> I do want to point out one thing, and that is in, um, once you start looking at the interface in, um, in kind of the, the right middle area, um, there is a, a bunch of tabs that allow you to um, uh, do a lot of formatting of the, the plot types. And there's a very critical checkbox um, in the common tab um, called Use Python. And because we've now made the transition over to having Python as our, our core um, computation and plotting layer, um, it, the default um, check is, is use Python. But if you want to um, you know, do some comparison between Python and R scripts, especially if you've used MetViewer in the past, um, just to, to you know, do some sanity checking and make sure that the Python version is doing exactly what you expect it to, you can toggle between um, use Python and, and, and um, turn it off as well. So we have a lot of different plot templates in MetViewer. Um, you know, the primary one is you know line, line um, plots or series plots. Um, that also allows for um, you know computation of uh, confidence intervals, um, and then we also have the ability to do pairwise differences and then look for statistical significance. Um, you know, on on those series plots, which is um, you know pretty important for trying to determine whether two model configurations are performing um, equivalently or if one's um, you know, performing better than the other. We have box plots. Um, and those um, not only uh, uh, you know, have the, the, um, the interquartile range, it also has the notches for the median, um, as well as um, you can ask to display outliers and so forth. Um, we have bar plots. If you want to just you know, look at basically a um, you know, histogram or bar, um, plot type of, of data. Um, we also have contour plots, which allow you to define um, basically three dimensions of the plot. You have um, the x-axis. In this case, this is um, uh, pressure. You have the, the y, uh, excuse me, you have the x-axis, sorry, that's forecast lead. In this case, the y-axis, which is pressure or um, uh, uh, equivalent to, to height as well. And then you have your value. In this case, it's bias. And so you can you know, kind of look at this um, in a three-dimensional uh, type of, of um, sense. It, it kind of helps you synthesize the data a little bit more. 
For ensemble and probabil probabilistic um, evaluation, uh, we do have the computation of not only ring histograms, but also probable, probability integral transform histograms, or PITs, as well as um, uh, uh, it's, uh, relative um, position uh, histograms as well. Um, we have the computation of ec economic cost loss value, rock diagrams, reliability diagrams, and um, using the, the series um, plotting capability, you can plot both spread and skill on the same plot to get your um, spread skill diagrams. Um, <clears throat> and then we do have <clears throat> what I call synthesis diagrams, which um, you know allow you to look at multiple statistics um, in one uh, place for possibly multiple models so that you can get a sense of which is performing better than the other. So performance diagrams um, synthesize four different categorical statistics. Taylor diagrams, on the other um, hand, uh, uh, excuse me, um, uh, synthesize um, four different um, uh, continuous statistics. Um, we have customizable scorecards. This is what they look like, and it's customizable in, in the sense of what you can have, um, you know, each uh, in each row and column, as well as the colors and the symbols and everything else. And then um, we have what's called revision series, or um, to give you a sense of forecast consistency. Right now, that's very much tied to um, using mode time domain to identify objects. Um, this is the interface that is available for Men Express, and um, Molly Smith from NOAA GSL is going to be, um, you know, presenting um, at the end of this hour um, some examples of the Men Express um, interface. And then I just wanted to point out to you um, in the, the slide deck, which is already posted um, up to the the agenda and recordings um, part of the website, that um, there is a quick start guide um, in the slide decks, um, which kind of shows you all the different steps um, how you can you know, quickly um, start generating a plot. Um, so uh, feel free to, to use this to also support your, um, your, your effort to um, trying out NetViewer um, after you see the demonstration from uh, Tracy. So with that, um, while I stop presenting, um, are there any questions while Tracy starts bringing up her um, portion of the presentation and demonstration? It looks like Tracy put the um, the link to um, the the NCAR um, instance of um, MetViewer um, in the chat. Um, while you you can um, you know follow along during the demonstration, we actually recommend that most of you just kind of um, watch and then maybe come back to the um, to the interface um, at a different time so that we're not hitting the um, the database too hard and and you know don't um, stress out the system. But um, you know, certainly, if you do want to try something out, um, you know, go ahead. But if it's if it's behaving slowly, then it, it probably means that we have too many users on the the system at this point. So, Tracy, take it away. All right. Thanks, Tara, for that nice overview of Met Viewer. Um, yeah, I'll just dive into it. So, the first thing I'm going to go over is how to create and load your Met Viewer database in the first place. So, I have on here. Uh, the list of commands, simple commands that you would put on your command line to create a new MetViewer database um, where you would replace the things in red with, say, your username, your password, and the descriptive database name that you want to assign your MetViewer database. Um, you would apply the MetViewer schema to that new database, so you'd use the same database name, and then you have your, your new MetViewer database um, created, and you can load your data once you've um, put that in, or, uh, uh, done those commands. Um, so loading the database, there's a script called mvload um, in the bin directory under MetViewer, and you would just uh, execute that with the path to an XML that has all of the uh, specifications for loading your data. And you can output the uh, runtime uh, log information to a log file if you want. Um, another thing that I'll mention is you can remove a, an entire database as well uh, using this command um, just to uh, extreme caution with this, so you don't want to, you know, randomly delete delete a, a database that you don't mean to. So just make sure that you're deleting the database that you intend to delete. So that's just an overview of how to create your database on the command line using those commands and loading the database. 
This is an example of the MetViewer load XML. So this is the XML that you would pass to your load script. Um, and so it contains all of those load specifications. Um, the first block is your parameters for connecting to the database. So your system and your, your port number. Um, this database na is the, the name of your database. So the DB name that you assigned when creating your database. Um, your username, password, uh, management system, which here is MariaDB. Um, and so those are all for connecting to the database. The next block is the parameters for toggling on and off what data you want to load um, and how, how you want that load to be applied. I'm just going to go over a few of these. Um, so the ver verbosity is just um, describing how, how much volume you want output in, in your um, loading. Um, the, the header DB checks uh, for mode and stat, uh, they query checks for your stat header file info while you're loading the database. Um, I recommend setting these to false unless you really, really need it because it can bog down the load time um, and take a really long time. Um, apply indexes. So if you are uh, loading a database for the first time, you want to apply these indices. Um, so you want to set that to true. If you have data loaded in a database already and you're loading more data into that database, um, go ahead and set that to, to false for applying the indices. Uh, the next uh, few lines are what data you are loading. So stat data, mode data, match pairs data, uh, observation rank files, um, just setting those to uh, true or false depending on what data you want to load. Uh, this next line, um, force dupe file. So if you have already loaded data um, in a certain path directory um, and you want to reload that data, you can set this to true and it'll force those duplicate files to be reloaded. And this last line, the verification group or this group, um, which is labeled as verification here, I'll show that um, um, in the uh, live demo. Next up in the load XML is the parameters for listing the date strings. So you would um, include your, your start time, your end um, time, and your increment in the format of your date string. And those will be used um, for loading your data. Um, in the red box here is your folder template. This is basically the, the directory or location of the data that you're loading. Um, and then you can see that it is, you know, stratified by, say, model, forecasting it, and your MET tool in this example. So these parameter listings in the next chunk below that are the values listed for um, that folder template. So for, for model, you can see down here, uh, model, we're, we're loading model one and model two. Um, we're requesting um, for forecast init all of these dates that are listed in the folder dates. So forecast init. And then met tool, um, that field has grid stat, point stat, and mode. So we want to load all of those. And that's just how our, our data is structured in our directory and how we're defining that uh, folder template there. And so yours, yours might be you know, quite different from that, but that's just an example. And then these bottom two load lines are options to save an XML with a load note. Um, if you wanted to include a load note while you, uh, for loading your data, um, you would need to set this to true. Um, just tells you what data was loaded or whatever, whatever you want to put in that load note. All right. And so that is the entire MetViewer XML. One thing that's not in this is you can also uh, define what line types you want to load. If you don't define a line type, like your FHO or your contingency table counts, and it's going to load all of those line types that are in the data that you're asking to load. But you can specify exactly what line types you want to load. All right, I'm going to move on to the demo. So exiting out of that guy. So this is the MetViewer web interface that you saw um, in the slides from Tara. And so now that we've loaded our database, we can select our database up here. Notice there's a number of groups here, and that is um, um, kind of what I was showing in that, that group configuration in the load XML. You can specify what group you want to load that data into. And you can see under various groups, you have a number of databases within that group. Um, and so if you don't select a group, um, that will go into a, uh, a group called no group. So um, the, 
just think something to point out. So there's quite a number of no group uh, databases here. We're going to go ahead and uh, use a global model test bed um, database here. Um, and we're going to look at some time series. So as, you, as Tara mentioned, there's all these options up here, um, uh, tabs for various uh, uh, plotting types. And we're going to go ahead and try a, a time series for starters. Um, so if you look at the plot data, you have your options for looking at just statistics, your mode, or your mode time domain data. Um, for this database, we only have stat data available. And so as I mentioned, we're going to look at temperature. This is your y-dependent variable, so the variable that you're going to be plotting on your y-axis. And these are all of the metrics or statistics um, that, you can, that you can plot or generate um, for that variable. Um, notice if you hover over that, you will get a longer description of what that variable is. So we're going to go ahead and um, plot the bias corrected uh, root mean square error for temperature. And this is, the next one is the series variables. These are the various lines or series that you want to plot. So for each selection you make here, you'll get a separate line. And so we're going to go ahead and select model. We're not going to plot all of these right now because it's just going to get pretty pretty messy. So we're just going to select a couple, uh, looking at the Grail Freitas DA on, on this specific grid, grid 218, um, the SAS DA on grid 218, which is basically the GFS at the time. And so we're just going to plot those models. But say if you wanted to also look at, you know, lines for separate initializations, say the 0 or 12 UTC initializations, you could specify those here, different masks, etc. cetera. Um, and you would get a line for each of those um, different um, series alone. Um, I'm going to jump down to the independent variable. This is your forecast, or your, this is your x-axis. And I'm going to go ahead and go with forecast lean time since we want to plot a time series. And I'm just going to go ahead and check all, or you can check specific ones if you would like as well. Um, and then now we'll go to the fixed values. And this is how you can further re refine or, or stratify uh, how you want to uh, plot your data. And so our first drop down menu, we could stratify um, uh, across a number of different things. Uh, here we're going to go ahead and pick uh, op type. And this is, you know, uh, our uh, surface or our upper air. And we're going to go ahead and plot surface temperature. So we'll pick that observation type. Um, you can also um, look at masks. So we've generated our statistics under across a number of masks. So you can um, aggregate um, over all of the, uh, a few of those masks, a couple, or just one. We're just going to select one. If you select multiple, it's going to aggregate all of those in, into the, the line that you're, that you're, or into the series line that you're plotting. Um, another option I want to show real quick is we can choose, say, um, our forecast initializations. You can select from this drop-down menu um, what you want to do here, or you can uh, click these boxes to the right and either select a start and end and increment time and select it that way, or you can click this far right one and you now have a calendar where you can just select your start and then go and select your end. So we can, you know, close this, you can select an increment. Here we have data for you know just one initialization per day. It's going to select all of those when we hit close. And so we have our five days uh, listed here for our initializations. And we can go ahead and just quickly generate that plot to see what it looks like. All right, uh, this is our, our plot of what we just uh, plotted. So our, our red line is the GFDA, our purple line is the, the SAS DA for temperature bias corrected RMSE. Um, this is the Python plotting capabilities interface. Um, and you can you know, zoom in, you can zoom out and scale your plot. Um, you can do toggle spikes and notice if you hover over it, you get the values um, as well um, for, the, for the nearest point. Um, you can also select compare data on hover. So if you select a, a value, you get a comparison data also uh, of the other lines also printed out on the interface. Um, and you can further refine this plot with formatting here in, in these tabs down here. 
as well as your, your list of your series down here. So you can see um, our x-axis values are being you know, overlapped, so we can refine that. Uh, we can change our, our plot title, so you know, temperature. Oven. We can change our x and y labels. I'm not going to do that here. Uh, we can add a caption. I'm going to add that just so we can see what it looks like. And we'll just do uh, conus, if I can spell. Um, for grid 218, and that'll print out a caption on our plot as well. Um, as mentioned here, automatically the Python plotting capabilities are used. You can uncheck this to um, use the R script, R script capabilities. And there's a number of other um, options here. You can stagger your, your Y points. Um, this is generally nice to use if, especially if you're using confidence intervals, so they're not you know, overlaid on top of each other and you can see them better. Um, you can print your series values um, up here in this tab, so you can select that, um, explain the number of stats, um, plotting the grid or not, and then some options for creating a vertical plot, which I'll show next. And these are just plot formatting, so you can change the text size um, and weight of titles. You can change your plot um, size and formatting. Um, you can change your grid line formatting in this one. And the X and Y um, formatting can be done here where you can change the label formatting and the value formatting. I'm gonna go ahead for our X1 and change our frequency to two here. And that's just gonna change our frequency on our X axis. So we're plotting every 12 hours instead of every six hours and it'll make a, a much nicer X axis that, um, that's more readable. Um, so that'll demonstrate you know that we can also change our legend um, size and whether we want to box around it or not a number of columns um, and our caption formatting down here we have our series formatting so each series that we have listed up here we're going to get a line down here um, and we can uh, further format that we can change the line color say we can change it to blue we have our point symbol. We can change this point symbol. Right now we're using a small circle, but you can change that to um, a number of various other symbols. Um, for the series line type, we have a number of different line types, just points, a line without the symbol, uh, and a number of other options as well. Um, and then we can also choose a dashed line, dotted line, um, and so on. We can change the line width down here. So if we change it to two, and these are just nice things, refinements that we can do to make our plot more um, ready for presentations, for papers. Um, we can change our legend, legend labels down here as well. Um, so that's, that's pretty useful. Um, and so one more thing that I'm gonna show on this plot is how to also add a derived curve. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this uh, plus down here for adding a derived curve and it'll bring up this menu and you can you know do like a difference in all of these uh, the ratio skill score we're going to go ahead and do uh, the, the SASDA or basically our GFS minus our GFDA of bias corrected RMSC and plot a difference line here and so we will go ahead and create that and you can see that it now creates a new series line down here and we can go ahead and change the color of that, say green, change our, our line width. Um, also, we have uh, confidence intervals that we can specify on you know, all of the lines or one of the lines. We'll go ahead and change the confidence interval here um, on the, the difference line to use a, a confidence interval and show that. And I think we're just gonna go ahead and plot this and see how that looks. It does take a little bit of time to plot sometimes, depending on how much data is loaded um, and, and what you're, you're requesting. So this is our a plot that's you know refined a little bit more, but we could certainly do more, like change our text, uh, our X and Y axis labels. Uh, we didn't uh, specify uh, a legend text for the difference line, but it is very descriptive, so it tells you what it's doing. It's doing the SASDA minus the GFDA um, series. We see our um, confidence intervals um, listed here as well on our difference line. And if you talk over that, you can see the values for the 
the median value as well as your confidence interval value. Okay. All right, I'm going to show next how to, I mean, you can remove this derived curve, so then you can select this curve um, in the list here, and you can just remove it at any time. So now we, we don't have that derived curve anymore. And the next plot I'm going to show is, you know, since we're here, is how to create a vertical levels plot. We're going to use the same exact data, but we're going to change our ob type now for a vertical level plot to upper air. Um, I'm going to get rid of that. For now, um, we would change our independent variable. Instead of forecast lead, we'll use forecast level and select these values. I'm going to go ahead and check all. It's easier than going through and checking just the P1s, and we can uncheck the, the Z2 if we don't want to plot that. So we're checking all of these pressure levels. Um, I'm also going to select you know, a single forecast lead. So you can, if, if you don't select a single forecast lead, you're going to get your level plot uh, aggregated across all of the forecast leads. So we'll just do forecast lead 48. Um, and then the last thing you want to do before we create the plot is go to the, the common tab. We will select the vertical level spot. That will basically switch our axes for the vertical level spot. We also, for our pressure plot, we want to reverse our x values so that it goes from you know, high pressure up to low pressure at the top. And I think we're ready to generate that plot now. So you can see it's pretty easy just to change from a time series to a vertical level plot with the same data. So here's our vertical levels plot. Um, notice that it's only plotting a frequency of every two still. This is still considered the x-axis, um, so it's still doing that frequency of every two. All right, and then the next one I'm going to show is, oh, actually, I wanted to mention that you can save your plots once you've refined it and, you know, got it looking the way that you want it to look. You can save it. There's a little button in the upper right corner to save your plot. You can also save your XML. So this is the XML file um, that was created for creating this specific plot with all of the formatting that we have specified here as well. So you can also download this XML. And then at a later time, you can you know, upload that XML into the MetViewer database up here using the load XML button and um, easily create that plot without having to go through what we just did. Um, the log tab is just the, the log output of running the plot. Um, if you are um, using R script rather than Python, you'll have R script, but we don't have that here. Um, this is the, the data that's being um, used for creating the plot. Uh, the SQL is just the commands to query the database here. And then, um, as I mentioned, Y1 uh, points, um, if you select uh, printing Y1 series values and regenerate your plot, then you can get those uh, points um, output. You do have to refresh that. So here we have our, our points listed here. Um, and Okay, so that's a vertical level plot. We can also do uh, like a, for example, um, a, a threshold plot for precipitation. So we can go ahead and choose a file. I'm going to just upload it instead of going through all the steps um, and open an XML that I have uh, previously created. And we'll hit OK, upload. And that uploads, you know, all of the formatting that I had um, set for creating a precip threshold plot for Gilbert skill score using the same models. Um, and here our independent variable is our thresholds. Here I've selected aggregation statistics and you can also um, specify your number of boot replications uh, for bootstrapping. I'm not going to increase that because it does take a long time to generate. Um, and we can generate that plot. And so just simply looking at how we can make a series plot into, say, a vertical level plot or a threshold plot for precip and so on. All right, I'm just going to start fresh here because um, I'm going to start with an, a new database. I'm going to demonstrate um, uh, uh, some mode capabilities in MetViewer. So we're going to use um, Air Force uh, GSWR um, versus MRMS mode. Uh, the GSWR was a global synthetic satellite 
or global synthetic weather radar uh, product that we compared to the MRMS observations. Um, and this database only has mode data in it. So the plot data is automatically showing that we're using mode. And for our Y dependent variable, we're just going to use reflectivity for this um, comparison. Um, and we can select um, you know, our ratio stats or area ratio stats. Um, but here, I'm going to select some attributes. Um, these are all of the attributes of your mode objects um, that are output from running mode. So your, your counts, your centroids, areas, intensities, etc. I'm going to go ahead and look at area. And that brings up a, a list to the right um, where we can look at the difference. We can look at forecast or observed objects simple or cluster objects, and match and unmatched objects. Uh, for this demo, I'm going to look at, you know, for this line series, we're going to look at forecasts, simple objects, and we're going to look at all of the objects. Um, if I wanted to look at the observations, I can select another uh, dependent variable, selecting area again, and now I uncheck forecast, and I can uh, check the observations, again, looking at simple and all matched and unmatched objects. Um, for our series variable, we'll go ahead and select model, which was the GSWR. And now we have our series lines down here, area FSA, which stands for forecast simple all objects and um, observed simple all objects for our area. And there weren't any uh, fixed values to really further refine this. So I know that for a fact we plotted the valid hour here. So we're going to go ahead and check our valid hours um, for our um, independent variable for our x-axis and go ahead and just generate the plot to demonstrate um, the mode capability. Tracy, in the interest of time, um, probably only three more minutes left so that we can give Molly time for MedExpress. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and so this shows us our, our mode, um, our forecast, which was the red line, and our um, observations, which were the purple line. And these were object areas. And so you can see that the forecast um, had more uh, larger object areas than the, the observations. And so um, that, that concludes the, the, the MET demo. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and go back to the... Uh, PowerPoint real quick to look at the scorecard real quick. All right, so this is my last slide. So this is the MetViewer scorecard um, as Tara showed. It's an option to graphically present your verification results for stat output for comparing models. It's highly configurable uh, for showing statistical significance stratified across a, a number of you know, specified metrics or fields, et cetera. Um, and one thing to note that it's not available through the MetViewer web interface. You do have to run the, um, the, Met, or the scorecard plots through the, the batch engine for MetViewer right now. Um, and so this is just an example, a very simple one, where, where our blue um, shapes and shading are um, defining, the, you know, your model one is better than model two at our, our a particular significance level, the, the red shading or shape is that model one is worse than model two at the speci specified significance level. Grays is there's no statistical significance between the, the two models. And then to create the scorecard, I've just included how you would do that. So you would uh, run this um, scorecard script in the bin directory of MetViewer and then pass it an XML um, that has the scorecard configuration. And I'll briefly go through that XML um, here, and we'll have this scorecard up so you can kind of compare um, while we're going through this. Uh, so this is the XML, and again, we have our connection information here, where our script is located. So this scorecard in particular is using our script. The, the folder directories, so our input and output directories are, are labeled here, and then it gets into the plot specifics. So do we want to view the value on the scorecard? We have that set to false, otherwise we would see, uh, say, the p-value. Um, uh, viewing the symbol set to true, so we have the symbols applied and the legend is on. Um, 
Another thing that I want to point out is this threshold file you can set. This threshold file can um, put in some, you can put in some common um, configurations, say um, your your plots, your scorecard specifications of you know colors and symbols used and so on. Um, and so you can specify that threshold file separately so you don't have to put that information into every single scorecard. Um, our plot fix values, we're, we're comparing these two models, the GFDA and the SAS for model one and model two. And we're looking at these uh, forecast initializations here. All right, um, this defines the rows. So our rows starting with mean error statistic, we're looking at mean error. And under mean error, we're looking at these variables, temperature for all of these forecast levels, relative humidity for all of these levels, and wind for all of these levels. And so you can see those listed here in the rows. And then last, we have our columns, which is the CONUS mask, and for all of these forecast lead times that are listed here. You can specify whether you want to aggregate your statistics or not in group replications. And then finally, um, this is just the template for your output um, file names and your title. Um, and so that um, concludes the Met Viewer demo. And I will pass this on to Molly. Um, while uh, Molly's bringing up her um, screen, uh, Steve Lack asked, um, do the scorecards rely on R or have they been um, pushed to Python? And um, uh, I'm actually going to ask Tatiana to answer that. Is, ha has the transition um, happened for scorecards over to Python? Uh, sure, a scorecard actually get generated by Java, uh, okay. but the statistics for scorecard, including p-values, get calculated in uh, either Python or uh, R script. Okay. Yeah, so if you don't have the map viewer, um, the, the full um, capability, then uh, you should be able to, to generate a scorecard um, using uh, you know, the batch engine and, and uh, MetCalcPy, MetPlotPy. Um, okay, just a, a few more things. Sorry about this, Molly, but um, I did want to add that um, Tracy went over mode outputs. Um, we're going, going to be going over mode um, the last week of, of April. Um, and so we'll uh, kind of re review, um, you know, uh, working with the mode output in, in MetViewer at that point. Um, that we do have a user's guide for MetViewer. Um, I put that into the um, chat as well as um, there is an online um, tutorial for MetViewer, um, you know, uh, bundled with our online tutorial. So I put that link um, into the chat as well. And now I'm going to hand it over to Molly, who, um, if your head is dizzy from seeing all the capability that is um, possible in MetViewer, maybe this will make you a little less dizzy because it's a little bit more straightforward. Molly, take it away. I, I will do my best. So. <laughs> but um, anyway, so Tara showed this uh, uh, basically screen earlier. Uh, this is the EMC installation of MedExpress. It's at uh, medexpress.nws.noaa.gov. And I'm bringing this up first because it does have a really good list of all the apps that are in MedExpress. Um, we have two apps that look at upper air statistics. We have Met Upper Air, which does uh, statistics such as bias and RMSE for uh, variables at different pressure levels. We have anomaly correlation, which uh, as it says on the label, plots anomaly correlation at different pressure levels. Um, we have two surface apps. We have uh, Met Surface, which plots variable, excuse me, which plots statistics such as RMSE and um, uh, bias, et cetera, at, uh, at different surface levels like uh, Z2 for temperature or Z10 for wind. Uh, we have an air quality app, which uh, is also surface-based and shows uh, various air quality related variables. Um, we have a precipitation app, uh, which I will demonstrate later, but you know, plots precipitation. And then we have uh, three specialized app. We have Met Ensemble, which is uh, designed to plot plot types and statistics that are specifically useful for ensemble data. We have Met Cyclone, which uh, plots tropical cyclone related verification. And then we have Met Objects there at the end, which uh, is less than two weeks old and uh, is for plotting mode data. 
Uh, but for, for my demo, I'm actually going to switch to using the uh, GSL installation of MedExpress uh, because it is actually used a lot more than the EMC installation. And thus, I have some uh, more interesting data sets there that I can, I can show you. Uh, so can everyone see my, uh, my screen here? Yes, okay, I don't hear any cries of negation, so I, I think that's probably good. Uh, so these purple buttons down at the bottom represent GSL's installation of, of, of MedExpress. Um, and we will start with Met Anomaly Correlation as our first app. And I'll make this slightly larger because when we were testing this earlier, some people said they couldn't read it. Um, but anyway, so in our Anomaly Correlation app, we have five plot types, excuse me, six, I can count plot types that are available uh, for people to make. And like Tara said earlier, the whole philosophy behind MedExpress is that um, it doesn't do as much as MetViewer, but MetViewer does have quite a steep learning curve. So if you want to just plot the most common plot types quickly and easily, uh, MedExpress it can be a better option for you, depending on what you want to do. If you want to really take a deep dive into your data, then MetViewer all the way. Uh, but if you just want to analyze maybe an experimental data set, I would, uh, I, I would present MedExpress as a good option. Um, so anyway, let's make a time series of anomaly correlation. And like uh, MetViewer, um, you, you would choose what group of data you want to look at and what database. And we're going to look at the default for the moment, which is the, the GSL global grid to grid real time database. And let's plot the GFS over the full domain. Let's look obviously at anomaly correlation of uh, height at uh, 500 millibars at 120 hours into the forecast. And I'm going to just for fun compare that with an in house. Uh, GSL FE3 run, which uh, has a different physics package. And so if we uh, plot these two curves, uh, we, can, we can see them over the last month. Um, hold on. If I do want to plot a different date range, I would do that down here, but let's just look at a month. And um, the nice thing about MedExpress is that it's really easy to customize the appearance of your plot without needing to replot it. So say I just absolutely hate the colors that these curves are. Um, I can go up here to the curve styles button uh, in this toolbar. And let's say that I want curve one, or excuse me, curve zero to be purple, and I want curve one to be teal, just because. And I want them to be dotted lines. And I want the line weight to be six. Let's have some, some nice, extremely visible lines. I can uh, go and I can have them plot diamonds instead of dots. And I can have really large markers. And I don't have to then replot. I can just click that and it creates my incredibly hideous curves down here. Um, and let's say that I don't really like this, uh, this axis font size. I can click on this axis button here. And I can um, I can go and I can I can change the uh, the X label font size and let's say I want it to be a little smaller. I can change the tick font size, make that a little smaller as well. Um, I can also let's say I want uh, the Y axis to have three significant figures. It seems to have two as the default. Um, and I want that grid on the back of the graph to be just very visible. So I, I'm going to increase its line weight. I can do that and I can get my, again, admittedly hideous plot. Um, <laughs> so if I just decide that this plot is too ugly to live, we, we do have a reset button up here in the, uh, the top right that looks like a, a, a browser refresh, basically. So if you click that, it'll, it'll put your defaults back. Um, and I can also change these uh, legend defaults because when, since I've zoomed in, they don't really fit on the screen very well. So let's say I just want curve zero to let us know that it's the GFS. And I want curve one to let us know that it's the uh, GSL different physics package run. I can do that and it's, it's there. Uh, and if I decide that this is just such a gorgeous plot that I, I want to include it in a, in a paper that I'm, I'm making, I can click this preview button 
and it oh actually that's pr probably not screen share. Is this being screen? Yeah. Oh, actually, Google is smart enough, I think, to do that. No. Okay. Let me. Um, sorry, I, I did rehearse this, but not with screen sharing. Um, so if I click that preview button, I end up with. Um, no, it's not an option. Well, anyway, it, uh, Google is not letting me screen share it, but it does open the plot in a separate window and you have a button in that separate window to save it as a PNG or as a, as a PDF. And then you've got a nice publication quality plot that you can include in a paper should you want to. Um, so returning to what I was sharing earlier, um, I can add a difference curve to uh, to this plot if I want by clicking show matching diffs. Uh, and then if I want to specifically take a closer look at my difference curve, I can zoom in to that. And of course, it would not uh, draw the correct zoom box when I am actually giving a demonstration because it wishes to thwart me. But there we go. Uh, and then if I don't like the fact that it zoomed in, again, click the reset button, it goes back to normal. I can plot all of this as a profile. Uh, which will place the, um, all right, which will take a minute to plot apparently, but it will, it will place the pressure level on the y-axis. There we go. And I'm going to hide these legends because at, since I've zoomed in the browser window, they are covering the plot. Um, so that's not the most interesting because the difference curve is messing with the scale. So I'm going to hide it and then Auto scale, but no, okay. Well, we can zoom in um, and get uh, get our plot. But basically, I hope this shows that the plots are, are very responsive, so you can edit them in real time without having to replot. Uh, I can do a die off. Let's get rid of the difference curve this time because it's been messing with my scale. And we have a nice die off curve that has uh, forecast lead time on the x axis, and it just shows how anomaly correlation is. Uh, decreasing with lead time. Um, I can do a valid time plot, which puts hour of day on the x-axis. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. These um, models are only being verified at zero Z, so that's uh, not an interesting plot. I can do a histogram, which will show the uh, distribution of the anomaly correlation over the time period I've selected. So this is the distribution of 120 hour uh, anomaly correlation at, at 500 millibars over the past month. Uh, so you can compare how both of them have been doing in a, in a histogram view. And then um, oh, let's remove this curve. Uh, you can also do a contour plot um, like in MetViewer. And I've got, in this case, forecast lead time on the x axis, and I've got pressure level on the y axis. And uh, you can just view it that way. Oh, and, and you, if you don't like this, uh, this color map, you can, of course, decide to use a different one. Uh, we, have a, we have a few available. So anyway, um, that is our anomaly correlation app. Our upper air app is uh, pretty similar, except that um, I've clicked on the wrong app. Never mind. Um, our upper air app is is pretty similar. Um, it does plot instead of anomaly correlation, you can plot RMSE, bias corrected RMSE, et cetera. Um, and basically, and also vector statistics. MedExpress do, does have vector statistics. Um, the surface app is um, the same as the upper air app, but it plots on uh, surface levels instead of on uh, pressure levels. And then we have the air quality app, which is uh, again, similar to the previous two. Uh, we do plot contingency table scores in this app. So if I want to do, look at the critical success index of uh, this particular model, I think we got this test data from Perry, um, then I can go ahead and do that and get a time series of, uh, looks like ozone mixing ratio uh, critical success index of this model. And uh, we do have threshold plots. So if you want to look at your air quality values at, um, at different thresholds, you can, you can do a threshold plot.
Um, we do have a precipitation app. Um, and in addition to plotting the usual plot types and threshold, we also have a, a grid scale plot type. So if I want to um, look at, for example, FSS of this um, on over grid scales, I can do that. And um, so you can look at, uh, it looks like this uh, data had uh, nine interpolation, or you, 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 can, you can look at the, uh, um, at the, the FSS score for uh, data that was interpolated with nine points, uh, 49 points, and um, 169 points. Um, but it's just, it's a nice way of say, seeing how your statistic changes if you include more grid points into your interpolation. We have our ensemble app, um, which in addition to having time series, die off, valid time, and histogram like the others, uh, you can plot an ensemble histogram, a reliability curve, a rock curve, or a performance diagram. So just to demonstrate the reliability diagrams, um, this looks like the uh, GSL real-time data set. And uh, that's a pretty miserable looking reliability diagram, but um, this is, uh, you know, it demonstrates it. Um, and I can plot a rock curve, get one there. Um, if I want, I can plot um, an ensemble histogram. And I'm going to choose a different data set for this. But if I want to look at the href version 2.1 uh, reflectivity, um, I can choose whether I'm plotting a rank histogram, a probably, probability integral transform histogram, or a relative position histogram, go with the probability integral uh, transform histogram, and I can plot that. Um, all right, not the most exciting graph again, but it is, uh, it is a plot. The rank histogram looks more exciting. No, all right. So not the most exciting data there, but uh, it shows you what you can plot. Um, and then our, our two newest apps are MetCyclone and MetObjects. And MetCyclone is designed to help you quickly analyze uh, tropical cyclone verification. So um, I have some uh, GFS ver uh, verification data from, from last hurricane season. So if I want to look at the uh, Atlantic uh, basin in 2021. Let's let's say I want to look at you know Hurricane Ida, which was a, a fairly long-lived storm, and I, I want to plot track error for Hurricane Ida at a 24-hour lead time. I can do that, and I end up with a a graph of Hurricane Ida's track error. Um, I can also change the track error to be um, let's say I just want to look at cross track error. I can I can get that quite easily, um, and then one thing that is also new in our Cyclone app is um, this year to year plot type, and this is basically a yearly averaged time series because a lot of times with uh, tropical cyclone verification you want to be able to demonstrate that your um, your skill has improved from one year to the next. So um, I don't know if I have a long-lived data set, but let's try this. Um, so if I want to look at um, Atlantic uh, track error from, from year to year, I can plot that specifically. And um, so with this particular test data set, it does look as though track error has increased from one year to the next, but I, I don't think that official uh, NHC forecasts have, have also followed that pattern. I think they've done quite well recently. And then just to wrap up, our final app is MetObjects, which I think is about a week old at this point. Um, but you can use this to plot mode data. And right now it only has statistics that uh, GSL was really uh, requesting, but I'm going to try to uh, add more in the future. Um, but we can look at object threat score. Um, and for uh, six hour precipitation, over the eastern conus at uh, a 24-hour lead time. And um, I'm going to change this date range to just be a week because um, this data is huge and can be a little slow to plot. 
Uh, but anyway, that while well, while this is plotting, um, that's that's most of what I wanted to say. Uh, hopefully, I wasn't rushing too badly. Uh, does anybody have questions? Um, yep, there we go to plot back. Oh, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, no, we've just been we've been trying to uh, improve MedExpress. I, I think I think it's its biggest um, like feature that I, I hope is useful is is the ability to just quickly customize your plot into whatever you want it to look like uh, without without having to replot it. Um, so I, I know that was a little fast. Oh, Marion has a hand up. Um, okay, yep. Yeah. I will share in the chat. This is again the uh, the GSL uh, version of um, of MedExpress, and um, so it's got it's got mostly GSL data on it. So here's the GSL installation, and then let me also actually share the EMC installation because if you uh, use MetViewer at EMC, your data should already appear in MedExpress um, in 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 the EMC version. So there's two two MedExpresses to play with. Um, <laughs> So have have fun and feel free to email me if you have any questions about it. Um, if also if we have it in containers if you uh, if you think you might want it installed locally uh, wherever you are, um, we can we can work with you to to get that installed. All right, so Tara has left, which means I have to wrap things up. So um, it doesn't sound like. Uh, anyone has has further questions so um i, I guess we're good thank you for uh, listening to me ramble about MedExpress for 20 minutes